as most of you have seen, I've been kind of sharing it on Facebook a little bit. We are going to talk tonight about a woman who pretty much rocked an entire culture because of one single um, encounter with Jesus Christ, and it was one woman. She revolutionized this culture. Um, She revolutionized a culture that almost missed out on the Messiah because they were so they were living so much into the past. They had, you know, they were so stuck in the past. And um, they, it was a culture that the Jews looked at as defiled. They did not, you know, think very well of, this, uh, of these people at all. These people were the Samaritans. And if anybody was here on Wednesday night, you guys, or last Wednesday, you guys heard me talk a little bit about it. The Samaritan people were considered very unclean people to the Jews. Um, when, the, when the northern Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians, you know, they come out, they, they t- removed all the high-class Jews, they left others that were there, they brought in other uh, cultures, they intermed- uh, intermingled, they intermarried, whatever all that word is, uh, those words are. They just kind of mixed. Religious, religiously they mixed, and ethnically they mixed. And so the Jews really looked down on them, you know, for that. And um, whenever Babylon, Babylon came in and they um, took over, they let all, their, all the people go back home to their lands, but the people that had, had um, intermixed stayed, and that land became um, Samaria. And so the way that the Jews looked at this land was that, first of all, the people were very bad. Um, they did not have anything to do with them, but they would also, in order to get to where they were going, they would literally leave Judea or whatever, you know, it was down here on the map. I don't have a map with me tonight, but it would, it's down here. They would cross over the Jordan River, they, and it would take them days to do this to where if they went through Samaria, it was a two-day travel. But they would take days to do this. They'd cross over the Jordan. They would go up beside it called the Transjordan. They'd cross back over close to Galilee, and then they would go in, about their business because they did not want their feet to touch the land of the Samaritans. And the reason that I'm sharing this with you is because it is important to know this woman's history and these, the history of these people as we begin to learn tonight, um, as, as I teach you guys this lesson tonight. Um, the other thing to really remember is that the Samaritan people are monotheistic. They strictly follow the Me- Mosaic laws, which is the first five books of the Bible. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So they only had the, the laws of Moses. They didn't have anything beyond that. So any of the prophets that spoke, anything that um, prophesied Jesus coming, they didn't have any of that. They just had those specific books. So that is, just remember that as we get into this. Can you hand me my water, please? My jug. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So so we're going to go back and we're going to look at her life, uh, or well, at at this moment, this encounter that she had with Jesus Christ. We really can't look at her life because we don't know a whole lot about where she came or what what kind of life she actually lived. Um, So we're going to go to John 4. I want to take you guys into John 4. We're going to spend the entire night there. And as we go through this, as we go through this encounter with her, as as we talk about, I want you guys to see how Jesus restores this woman's life. And, um, And this is exactly what he wants to do in each and every one of our lives as we move forward in our relationship with him. Um, so let's start at John 4 verse 3. And I'm going to read through 7. It says, um, And Jesus left Judea, and he parted again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. If you'll notice, it says he had to. And, she, and so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. One of the things that I will encourage you guys, anytime you're reading the word, pay attention to even the time frames because there's something significant even about the times. Um, It says it was the sixth hour. That was noon there. They lived in desert land. That is the hottest part of the day. That is why Jesus had to stop from his travels, you know, because he was weary. They were hot. So this woman is coming in from Samaria to get water, which is not the time that most people would get water. They usually would come early in the morning when it was cool, or they would come late in the evening when it was cool. So for her to be doing this, there's something that she's hiding. There's something that she is either ashamed of, or there's something going on that she doesn't want to be at the so- be there at the time that they socialize at the, at the well. She wants to be by herself, nobody around. And so I want, what I want you to see here is that... Um, as we continue reading, I'm going to give you these eight points. The first one is that Jesus renovates us. Whenever we have an encounter with him, he um, brings us to a place of being renewed by cleansing, repairing, and rebuilding. 
It's going to be kind of crazy the way that I, that I bring, this, bring this out, the way that he does this, but literally step by step you can see God doing this in her life as she's having this encounter with Jesus. And one of the things I want you guys to know also is that that's what we are here for tonight, is for each and every one of us to have an encounter with our God. We are not here, you know, just to listen to me teach this. I'm personally here to have an encounter with him. Y'all are personally here to have an encounter with him. Um, so just soak it in. All right, so um, like I said, renovate means to be renewed by cleansing, repairing, or rebuilding. And what I want you to see is that he's re he is renovating her mindset. Okay, remember me telling you that she is a Samaritan, right? The rabbinical law said that a Samaritan woman was unclean from birth. So this woman already has something going on that she's not socializing. And, you know, because in the Samaritans, they're not unclean amongst each other. Just to the Jewish people, they were considered unclean. So she's not coming to the well because of something going on personally. But now she's walked up to this well where there's a Jew setting, and he's just looking at her, and she's already probably thinking... Um, First of all, why is there a Jew at my well? You know, because they don't pass through this land. Second, I'm, he's probably looking at me, judging me, thinking I'm unclean, um, and things like that. So, and that would, to me personally, that would probably mess, w mess with my self-esteem. You know, just going in somewhere. Have you guys ever walked into a place and immediately caught someone looking at you, and you're like, they're judging me. You know, I mean, and they may not even have a clue. They're just kind of, they look you up and down, and in your mind they've judged you, but yet they don't really even know what they just did. I mean, their eyes just glanced, you know. Um, I used to be horrible about that. If I went in somewhere and saw somebody give me a look, immediately they don't like me. And they didn't, you know, I had someone tell me once, they're like, your perception is horrible. You know, just because they give you a look doesn't mean that, you know. And I had to retrain myself to not think that. And that's kind of hard <laughs> sometimes. Um, so when Jesus comes into our lives, he begins a process of repairing and rebuilding the brokenness. Um, and that's exactly what he's doing with her. He starts to mess with her theology a little bit. So he's a Jew sitting at a Samaritan well. He speaks to a Samaritan woman and asks her to drink from her, you know, her little thing that she, bucket that she would pull the water out with. If a, if a Jew was to drink from a Samaritan's water pot, they would, it would immediately defile them. That's, that was their law. They weren't even to drink from a Samaritan's pot. So for him to ask her that began to really mess with her thought process. She was probably thinking, whoa, you know, what is going on here? And so um, he was willing to be considered unclean for her. He was willing to have a name, you know, by the religious in order to reach her. He didn't care what they thought. He, was, he had an assignment. If you remember, I said he had to go to Samaria. He had an assignment to do. And so that was, he knew what his father told him to do. Um, let's go back and read 7 through, I think it's, I think I got ahead of myself there, or 9 through 15. Okay, so it says, The Samaritan woman said, How is it that you, a Jew, would ask from me, a woman of Samaria, because remember the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan, or ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaritan. I can't even talk, guys, sorry. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, and you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. The woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. Where do you get this living water from? And are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well, and he drank from it himself, as did his son and his livestock. See how she's kind of sticking to that old mindset of, Jacob built this well, so this is, this is our place. You know, there's nothing better than this. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. For whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I will not be thirsty or have to come draw water. Come here again and draw water. And so he's, he's kind of messing with that, with that theology. He's kind of engaging her into, into conversation. He's like, you know, I'm going to kind of go back to her, to what she believes, and bring that out. Because to them, that well was living water. That was their source of life. That's what they used to, you know, to do everything with. So he's, you know, kind of playing on her a little bit there. And um, one of the things, too, that I want to mention before we get much further is that when I talked about how he, re the process that of repairing and rebuilding the brokenness in our lives, um, as I was reading through this again today, I was thinking, you know, when we think of brokenness, we think of depression, which is a, bro a form of being broken. We think of um, 
you know, our hearts being broken by somebody, you know, just things like that. But one of the um, things I really thought of today is that it's not just sadness. Brokenness is not just sadness. Brokenness can be anything from shame, you know, something that we've done in the past. It can be guilt from choices that we've made. It can be regret from things. What, what, if, what if I would have done that? Or what if I would have said this or that? You know, I mean, bitterness from, from past things. I mean, there's so many things that can be brought into that single word of brokenness. And those are the things that God wants broken off of our lives so that we can walk whole in him. Number two that he does with us is he will engage you where you're at. Um, Engage means to attract somebody's interest. Do you see how when I was reading that, how Jesus was attracting her interest, you know, with, with that little talk about the living water? So in verses 10 through 14, you know, he caught her interest. He met her where she was. And like I said a minute ago, he knows that this, that this well was a lifeline. And so um, that's how he caught her attention to engage her, her in conversation. And one of the ways that I, you guys will eventually learn with me is I like to kind of break Scripture down a little bit and take what the words actually mean and replace them and make it to where I can actually understand it better. So um, I kind of put a spin on 10 and 14. But, you know, Jesus said, If you knew this gift sitting in front of you, if you knew what I had to offer, you would ask and I would give you living water. And that living water will cleanse you and fill you and cause you to spring up into eternal life. Um, and eternal life is uh, sozo. It's wholeness. It's healing. It's all-encompassing, everything that he has to offer us. And so, you know, Jesus didn't care, doesn't care for a scholar. He doesn't care if we're perfect. He doesn't care if we are somebody who has never even been educated in any, in any part of the word or anything. He doesn't care. He just wants to meet us where we're at. He met this woman where she was with simply, you know, all she knew was those five books, but he knew he could reach her with even that. And he will, and he says that we are to ask him. If we will just ask him for it, he will give it. Uh, Matthew 7, 7 says to ask, which means to crave. It says, and, we will be in, and it will be given to you. Seek, which means to desire, and you will find it. And then knock, I like this one. It says to knock with a heavy blow. So in other words, I mean, let them know you're there. And he says, and the door will be opened. And so that's all we have to do. All we have to do is go to God, and we have to seek and ask and knock, and he'll open the door to us. Um, verse 15 says that she asked. The woman um, is, in the, is beginning to see that something sp- there's something special about this man. Um, of course, because of the fact that she only knows the Torah, she's still kind of not understanding the spiritual side of the conversation. He's trying to offer her eternal life, the living water, and she's trying to figure out where is he going to get this water from because she doesn't understand the terms of the living water yet. So um, number three, he sees us. Our Father knows everything about us, no matter what we try to hide, no matter what we try to do, He knows everything about us. Um, When we begin to engage God, we will begin to crave Him and desire to learn about Him. We will begin to ask questions and seek Him out. We will begin to converse with Him through prayerful conversation, and as we do, He will begin to go deep inside of us, and He'll begin to pull things out, pull little things out, low self-esteem, you know, little hurts, just this and that. He'll begin to pull those out, and as He does, He'll begin to heal that. And, and refill it with him. And so I want you, I mean, he, he also sees, um, he, when, when Christ looks at us, he sees us as the crea- uh, creation that he created us as. We may look at ourselves and see fat, too tall, you know, too skinny, too this, too that. We may look at ourselves and see that, but when he looks at us, he sees perfection. He sees how he created us. And so, but he also sees how we've grabbed a hold of the enemy's lies. And he sees how we've allowed them into our lives. And, and that has begun to really mess with our own theology of, of ourselves, right? I know I, that is something that you will learn throughout this year that we battle with it. I mean, just as much as anybody else sitting in this church, you know, we battle with lies, you know, having to cast them down on a daily basis. Um, but that is, you know, that learning to cast them down is the biggest thing because the enemy is always going to throw lies at you just learning to cast them down. You know, don't let him put it in your pot. Um, Verses 16 through 19, it says, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I feel like, that was an eye-opening experience for her. How can any man 
that has never been to Samaria know everything about her. He told her everything about her. Um, that would I've had I've had people read my mail but never sit down and tell me everything about me. <laughs> that might might scare me a little bit. I might run. Um, so when she asked for what he had, when she began when she began to ask him, "Give me what you have. I want this living water." That's when he knew the only way she could receive it was to deal with what was on the inside. The only way we, we can receive things from God is to let him look inside of us and deal with what is on the inside of us. I truly do not believe, I have studied this, guys, for weeks because I had to teach it on a Wednesday night too, and I have studied it for weeks, and I do not believe this, that Jesus was calling out her sin. Yes, she had a sinful nature. Yes, she, you know, she had issues just like all of us do, but one of the things that I have heard so many different um, messages on, you know, very high up ministers preaching on her, talking about how, you know, she was trash and she was an adulteress and she was this and she was that. And I was like, but why? Why do you think that? Just because it says she had five husbands. And I'm going to explain to you why I think that in just a minute. And I may be wrong, but in my heart, it's just like, ah, I, I, my heart breaks when I hear people, you know, talk like that about her because we don't know. We don't know. It doesn't really say. But um, I don't see anywhere at all that Jesus, you know, tells her anything about sin. He just, he doesn't. And um, let me get back on my track here. I can get to talking and I'll lose focus really quick. Um, so anyways, what I feel like is that he was really calling out shame. He was calling out guilt. Um, he was calling out her regret, her emptiness, her hurt, the things that were embedded in her that were keeping her from socializing at that well with the other people, the things that were making her go to that well at the hottest part of the day. Um, those are the things that he needs to get rid of in her to, so she can fulfill her purpose in him. So why do I believe so strongly about that? We're going to look at a few other people um, really quick. I want to go to John 8, and then we're going to eat, uh, eat. No, we're not going to eat. We're going to, I'm really not even hungry. I don't know why I even said that. We're going to eat the word. There you go. We're going to eat the word. <laughs> All right, we're going to um, read 8, and I'm going to read really quickly um, 2 through 11. It says, Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been call, caught in adultery and placing her in his midst. They said to him, Teacher, pay attention here, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it commanded us to stone each woman or such a woman so that so what do you say? They were trying to catch Jesus there. This they said to him to test him, that they might um, have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down, and he wrote with his finger on the ground. Nobody ever has a clue what he wrote. I've asked and asked. Um, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up, and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once, and once more he bent down, and he wrote in the ground some more. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing there. Jesus stood up, and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn you. Now go, from from go and from now on sin no more. So he told her, Sin no more, after he you know, brought that healing, that restoration back in her, that I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And then when you go to um, John 5, I'm not going to read all of it, but it's the man um, that was healed at the pool of Bethesda. You know, Jesus went in and he asked him, he's like, you know, do you, do you want to be healed? And he was like, yes, but there's nobody to put me in front of this. You know, I think he'd lay there 38 years, something like that. And so, you know, Jesus bends down and he tells him, he said, take up your bed and walk. Well, later on, he comes back in the chapter and he looks at him and he says, you know, pretty much don't forget what has happened, but go and sin no more. So when Jesus would do certain things with certain people, he would tell them, go and sin no more. And nowhere in the entire book of, or entire chapter four do I see Jesus restoring her and then saying, go and sin no more. And so for me, it's like, I feel like he was dealing, more with, than just, dealing with more than just a sin. He was dealing with, with deep, you know, much deeper. And the things this woman ends up doing, which I'll tell you guys in a minute, I believe that is why, um, so, <clears throat> I want you guys to think about this. What I was just reading about the uh, Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was to stone a woman to death when she had an, adult, uh, uh, had an affair, when she had committed adultery. 
So the Mosaic law also was that a man cannot divorce a woman, or a woman cannot divorce a man, but a man can divorce a woman. So the only, only way I can see adultery there is the law also, I think it's the same law, also says that if a woman remarries after she's been divorced, that's con- considered a, adultery, I think is kind of the way that law goes. But so she's been married five times, so I'm thinking by husband two, she would have had to have been stoned to death because you can't run out of Samaria. She would, some, she would have had to have been stoned to death if it was an adulterous situation. So either she's had husband's men divorce her or maybe she lost her husband's to death. That's where that, that hurt, that, that emptiness would come from. The divorce, the, the men leaving her would be that, you know, just that regret or that, you know, what did I do wrong? Am I not good enough? Um, it could have been a mixture of both of those all together. And then the man that she's living with now doesn't even want to marry her. That would be, you know, just after having that many husbands either die or divorce you or leave you or whatever happened, and then the guy that you're with now doesn't want to marry her, that the hurt that is in her, God really wants to just, he wants to just wreck that. You know, he just wants to get rid of that. Um, but I can see how that would make her feel, you know, the lies of the enemy, the, the shame, the guilt, the insignificance, the depression. I mean, she didn't even want to be with other people. So, um, but in my, you know, as I've studied through this, I've, we, I realize, you know, we all deal with different forms of this. Every one of us, we all do. And honestly, we may, some of us may be feeling the same insecurities that she's feeling. Um, I kind of made a little list of insecurities here. I know for me personally, um, some of these insecurities are size. You know, I, I say this all the time. I get lectured all the time. You know, I'm too fat. I'm this. I'm that. I'm my new one I'm going to start using is I'm just too short. Because if I was taller, you know, hey. But, um, but, you know, just I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. You know, am I, am I good enough compared to this person? Or, you know, comparison can be one of the worst things that we do in this life. Um, what about, you know, just the, the guilt of, and I mean, I know this is personal, but it's just honest. I mean, what about I've been divorced or someone's divorced me or I had an affair. I'm unlovable. You know, I'm sure these are some of the feelings that this woman was feeling. Um, and then I got to thinking about, you know, just the simple uh, hurts and emptiness of, I have no purpose. You know, you may have none of that other stuff, but when you, but sometimes we walk around just feeling like we have no purpose in life, you know? I mean, that is, that's just as, as, you know, detrimental to us than, than anything. Um, you know, just all of that stuff. And those are the, those are the things that the enemy is placing in our head. Those are the things that he's filling our vessel with instead of us allowing God to fill it with the living water, the enemy on a daily basis. You know, somebody walks in and you see him and you're like, man, I'm not that pretty, you know, or I'm not that smart or man, I can't do that. I mean, just it every day. And we allow that to build and to build. And it just becomes something that, you know, that it becomes chains. It becomes binding to us. And that is something that God really wants to just break off of us this year. I will be the first to admit, I was listening to a message by Chris Vallotton, and one of the things he said in there is that you cannot lead somebody in something until you've had a personal victory yourself. So my goal this year is to break this off of, you know, break these, these lies off of my own personal life. And as I do, I want to see everybody that sitting here, you know, walk the same thing. Um, so we will fight them. We'll fight them with truth. We'll fight them with the strength and the knowledge of the word. We will fight them as a family. You know, when we have problems, we have each other. We aren't going to go to the well by ourselves. We're going to come in here and we're going to find us some, some people. Um, and through that, you know, we will learn to walk in his grace and truth. Through that, we will discover our identity in him and our identity in him and through, you know, who he is in us. Number four, he transforms us. This is my most favorite one. He transforms us. Um, verses 20 through 24, it says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. See how she completely changes the, the subject? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation comes through the Jews from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So as Jesus begins to um, reveal the chains that bind us, he'll begin to, kind of like what I like to call a little bit of open heart surgery. 
He'll begin to go in and he'll take our old heart stance. She has that old heart stance of worship. I have to be at a specific location in order to worship. I have to be at church in the front row in order to worship. That's one of my... <laughs> Anyways, you know, there has to be a specific place to worship. That's the way that their, minds, their mindset was. And so he, get, he begins to go in, and he's beginning to, to transform that heart stance. He's like, okay, now we got to get into, now that we've dealt with your shame and guilt, we need to get into to who you're worshiping. And so what he's beginning to tell her here is that you don't, it's, it's going to come the day that you're going to realize it's not about where you worship, but it's about who you worship, Right? We, can, we have learned now we can worship in our car. We can worship in this front row of the church. We can worship at home. Haven't figured out how to do it at work yet. But we, the bathroom, she says, I can go to the bathroom and worship. <laughs> but, I mean, we have learned that it's not, it's not one place because we actually worship 24-7 by just having conversations with our Father. So, um, so transformation is to change completely in composition or in structure. So I want to kind of read a few little scriptures here to you about um, how God transforms the heart. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So when we, when we are in Christ, he begins to get rid of that old creature. Just as we're watching him do with this woman here, he's getting rid of her old nature so that he can bring in something new. Um, and then Jeremiah 24, 7 says, I will give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord, and they will be my people. I will be their God, for they will return, they will return to me with their whole heart. So there's another one. As God begins to call us, we begin to give that whole heart to him. It's no longer about self. It's about what can we do for our God. Exodus 36, 26 says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove that heart of stone, which is hard and cold, um, from, from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. That sounds like transformation to me. It's transforming that heart of stone into something completely different. So the heart, heart in these verses is actually the word, I think it's pronounced lav. It's, it's L-E-B, but I'm just going to say lav. Um, and which actually is the inner man, the mind, the will, the understanding, and the knowledge. So what he's going in, this is what just completely got me, is he's going in and he's rocking, it goes back to that theology, he's rocking her knowledge, you know, her, her mind, her understanding, he's, going, he's transforming that. And as he does that, it's completely transforming her heart. You know, she's beginning to get a little bit hungry for what he's got for her. Um, so he'll take our old beliefs, our old mindsets, our old will, and then he'll begin to transform the most inner parts of our being and into knowing th through the knowledge of his word. Um, so just get ready. I'm just going to tell you things that may seem okay today, a year from now, they're not going to be okay no more. I'm just going to tell you that I have learned that. It drives my family crazy. But it is just things that were okay a year ago are no longer okay because as God begins to just transform and, and the Holy Spirit just begins to soften things, it just, it, it'll rock your world. It will just change your world. Um, but I want you to see how he's doing this with this woman. So, this, like I said, the Samaritan woman is all about the ge geographical location of things because of the Torah. You know, all throughout the um, Old Testament, or throughout those first five books, everything that they did, um, when, when God would move really big in someone's life, when he had promised them something or he would, you know, speak something over them, they would stop. They would build a memorial, they would worship, and they'd go on about their business. And then every time they came back, they would stop, they would worship at that memorial, and then they'd go on about their business. So that was kind of what, you know, that's what she's used to. So in, in her area where they had built this, um, where they had built the well, uh, when she's talking about the mountains, there was, there was a mountain, it was Mount Gerizim, and up on top of that mountain, there was a temple built. And that's where the Samaritans would go to worship. And the Jews would worship on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, right? Making sure I got that right. <laughs> I have to ask the teacher in the back. Um, so they would go on uh, to Mount Zion. And so she was saying, well, you Jews say this, and we say this, so which one's right? And, you know, and that's when God begins to tell her, it's no longer about place, woman. No longer about place. You know, and I'm fixing to show you, you know, he's, he's just telling her, I'm fixing to transform you. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of what she's talking about in those mountains there. She's still kind of hanging on to that, that knowledge of, of the Torah. So are you seeing how she's kind of still stuck in that? Kind of not understanding all of that? Um, but 
I want you to see how Jesus transforms her through the knowledge of who he is. Um, verses 21 and 22 um, goes back to, he says, Woman, believe me in this hour um, that is not, well, hang on, slow down, Sabrina. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jer Jerusalem um, will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. So Jesus begins explaining that to her, um, explaining that as the time has come that she will no longer uh, wor worry about where. It's going to go, you know, she's going to be, um, it's going to be about who. And so to me, I, I see that as dealing with old mindsets. You know, it's no longer about where, it's about who. He's dealing with that mindset. And if you go um, read that verse 22 in the New Living Translation, it says, you Samaritans know very little about the one that you worship um, because of the little knowledge and understanding that they have. While we Jews know all about him. How? Because they have the books of the prophets and they have, they have the knowledge that they need. He said, for salvation comes through the Jews. It's just my own little thought. Salva I haven't quite figured out what that, why he says that, so I put my own little spin on it. Salvation comes through the Jews because Jesus is a Jew and salvation comes through him. Easy enough, right? Um, so he's dealing with old belief systems. Um, so he's, he's dealt with her mindset. He's dealt with her belief system. And then in 23 and 24, he begins to explain to her that her hour um, of walking in old beliefs and old mindsets has come. It's, it's done. She's done. Her hour of transformation is here. And that is something that, you know, I want each and every one of us to grasp a hold of because it's our hour of transformation. You know, this is our time. This is our year. This is our season of transformation in this body. Um, I have a saying that I, I've said for probably two or three years, change the woman, change the home. And then change the home, you change where, you, you know, where that home touches. You change where they touch, you change a city. You change a city, you change a state. You change a state, you're going to change the nation, right? So we have to get this, we have to get set free. We have to. Um, let's see here. So when you go through here and you see that where he says, true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit there, spirit and in truth is a little s. It is um, referring to the intellect, the rationale, the power in which we think, we feel, we decide. It is our knowledge. And so he's messing with that theology. He's trying to explain to her. It's about the power of knowing him, who he is in us. That is the importance of it. How does he do it? How does he get this? How does he transform us and get all of this? Number five, he is omnipotent. Ooh, click that. Um, <clears throat> oh, I was going to read. Hang on. We're going to read real quick. 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Okay, it says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. So as God begins to change you, as he begins to transform you, um, don't fight the process. Just let it happen. It's, I fought it for quite a while, and it just makes, makes you, can I say uglier and uglier if you fight it? <laughs> it just makes you not a very, I don't know, just, yeah. It's, it's just when you fight the process, you're not walking in his will point blank. And so, you know, don't fight the process. Let him change. Let him transform. Um, let him do the work because you will come out. I always think of the butterfly. The butterfly is my most favorite thing. They go in that cocoon in that darkness and then they come out something absolutely beautiful. And so, and they can go places that the caterpillar couldn't go. And so, don't fight the process. Let him do the work. Um, he is omnipotent. Omnipotent is unlimited authority, infinite in power, able to do anything. This is who he is in our lives. This woman is still having a hard time understanding what Jesus is talking about. Um, kind of keeps bouncing, bouncing back to that old theology, you know, kind of going back and forth. She's like, well, um, got ahead of myself. 25, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So you see, she's going back to that. She's like, well, I know there's a Messiah coming because she knows the book of Deuteronomy, and in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, it talks about how he's going to, God tells Moses he's going to raise up a prophet from, like them from among his brothers. So she's going back to that, and she's like, so I know there's a Messiah coming, and when he comes, he'll tell me all things, because I'm sure by now she's starting to get a little bit confused, because he's going through all this spiritual stuff. So um, 
She does believe bec- that there is a Messiah coming someday that has unlimited authority, infinite power, and able to do anything in her life, but she just doesn't realize he's standing in front of her yet. And so he looks at her and he says, I who speak to you am he. This is the first time Jesus speaks um, his messianic declaration. It is the last time he really tells anybody actually who he is. Um, And he chooses to tell a broken, empty, hurt, Samaritan, unclean woman at a Samaritan well. And, you know, this is one of the coolest things ever, you know, that I just keep going back to. He didn't choose the learned scribes. He didn't choose the Pharisees. They questioned him numerous times, and he'd be like, well, whatever you want to think, you think. You know, the, so many people questioned him, but he chose this woman. He chose her for a purpose. And immediately, once, once he said that, immediately she knew. She knew this was her Savior. And so that is the kind of omnipotent God that we serve. He comes in, and he is so powerful, and he's just unlimited in what he does. And when we get a hold of him, we know he is our Savior. We know who he is. So immediately she knows, and immediately she believes. Number six, he restores us. 27 through 30 says, Just then the disciples came back. They marveled at that he was um, talking with a woman, but no one asked, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar, remember that, and went away to town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me all that I have ever done. Can this be the Christ? They, they went out of the town and were coming to him. So the disciples come in, and of course they're shocked. First of all, they left a weary, tired, hungry, thirsty Jesus at a well. Who in the world takes their time to minister to somebody when they're tired, thirsty, hot, miserable? Not many people. They probably wouldn't have. You know, second of all, he's talking to a woman. Teachers did not take the time to talk to women back then. Third, it was the Samaritan woman who was unclean to the Jews. You know, so they have all these questions of why is he even talking to her? And I'm sure they were back there, you know, mumbling amongst themselves. Um, So one of the things that I absolutely loved here is that it says even in his weariness, he took the time to restore a broken woman. Um, And that is something that I think as, um, you know, children of God, that is something that we need to let that same love flow through us, that even in the times of our exhaustion, even in the times where we're like, I want nothing to do with any of this, we should never pass up an opportunity to share anything about our, our God, our Savior. Amen? So Jesus is our ultimate example. So this woman has been restored. Restore means to put into or bring back into existence, to renew, to put again in the possession of something. When we feel as if we have lost our identity, we see ourselves as non-existent because of all those lies that we've talked about already. Um, When we feel like we are um, unloved and all hope is lost, we serve a God that restores. He takes what is lost and he brings us back into his possession. So he takes all of that and he brings it back into him. Um, He takes what is broken and he mends it. He takes what is hopeless and he brings life back into that. So how do I know that this woman was restored? How do I, I mean, just like, she just left. So how do I know she was restored? Because um, she, I put down she ran. I don't really know that she ran. I'm personally imagining that she ran. I would (laughs) have. I'm guessing she probably just left everything and just ran, you know. Um, She went back. It says that in 28 and 29, she left her water pots and she went. And so she went back and she told the entire city everybody that she could get into contact with about this man that has just read her mail. So, you know, that shows me that she's restored. Why? Because a woman who was still broken, carrying shame, carrying guilt, carrying hurt, walking whatever she was walking in, who had for God knows how long avoided the crowds to go by herself at the hottest part of the day, she was running back into the midst of that city and she was telling people about her God or about this man that she's found. She knows he's her God. So that is something that I know that woman had to have been restored. Um, one, and the other thing that completely got me, this was, I think it was just yesterday, I just really got this. Um, if you look up water jar, I just decided I would look it up. It actually means, it's hyd- hydria, which means a receptacle for family supply. So it's a supply receptacle, right? Well, she went to the well with empty receptacles. They were empty. 
Spiritually, she was empty. She went to the well completely empty. She had nothing left to give. She didn't have anything for her family. She didn't have, you know, for anybody that needed anything. She had nothing. Her vessel was empty. And so whenever she has this encounter with Jesus and he begins to, to just come in and just knock out that old theology and to show her that, that, yes, naturally you may be after this, but spiritually this is what you need. And he began to fill her. She literally left. She left everything at the well. She left her need. She left her hurt. She left her emptiness. She left her vessels at the well so that she could go back and she could tell these people about Christ. Um, so, I mean, to me, that is like, I don't, that is just amazing to me that she literally, she just ran. She just left it all, all at the foot of Jesus, right there at the well. And, um, Yeah, I had on here that she was so full that she literally left what was weighing her down. Um, I had a picture, I posted it on um, Facebook today to advertise tonight, but it was, it was supposed to be like when I put in the woman at the well, it showed her walking, but she had this, this um, stick thing off of her shoulders and it had all of her jars hanging. I thought he was putting something up there. Um, all of her jars hanging down and she's walking down to the well holding this stick. And I was looking at that, I was thinking, how heavy must that have been? You know, how heavy must that have been? And she carried that all the way down there to the well, but in her healing and in her excitement and in her restoration, she just leaves it there. She's like, forget this, I'm going to go get some better stuff. You know, she was ready. Um, she returned to this, to this city. She returned renovated. She returned engaged. Um, she had been seen. She had been transformed. She had, by her omnipotent God, who had restored her and filled her with a passion for Christ that I don't believe anybody to that day has seen. Um, this woman had a passion about her. I'm going to read to you guys here in just a little bit the, the rest of her story from this point on, but her passion absolutely has rocked me. I have read it so many times. The way I see it is that passionless people don't go back and tell an entire city about a man they just met. And that is one of the other things that I want to, I just want to impart into, into every single person that's here tonight is that passion. God is calling us back to a passion in him. You know, he, is, he needs a passionate people that is hungry and, and seeking and ready and that will go out from here and go to a city and transform an entire city with one word. Amen? Amen. Oh, God, that dang it. I should have got a little jug. I probably don't need that big one. All right, number seven. He establishes us. Establish. Um, Deuteronomy 28, 9 says, The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Establish there means, um, it's, it's kum, which also means to arise, to stand up, and to be fixed, which I thought was funny because I never had read that. And last year I had taught a message on um, the the little girl, uh, Talitha, he said Talitha Kume or Kum. I mean, it's the same word. It's just in the Old Testament. I thought that was really cool. So it means to establish, to rise up, to stand up and to be fixed. And that's what Jesus will do with us. Whenever he's gone through this process, he's going to bring us to a place where he can raise us up, you know, to be established as to where he needs us to be. So in 39, we're going to skip down a ways. Um, the, the part we're skipping is just Jesus and the disciples talking about food and harvest. Um, so we're going to go to 39. It says, Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. This was the first people group to claim Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. I think that is absolutely amazing. So remember this woman, um, she had a name in this town, right? Little Whatever it was, it wasn't right because they, they had nothing to do with her. She was an outcast. She was looked down upon. She didn't socialize. Everything because of the chains of her past and the present events that she had going on. And she really, I mean, she really had no name, guys. I have looked and looked and looked. I cannot find her name anywhere. I have looked. So she had no name. So spiritually, she, you know, she was broken. According to the people, she had no name. She was just, you know, she was nothing to them. She was an outcast. Um, and so 
Anyways, this woman became so established in her relationship with her father that he even gave her a new name. Um, nowhere, like I said, nowhere that I've searched, um, I could not find the name before this encounter with, with Jesus. But um, when our God gets a hold of us, when we get truly get a hold of him, when we see who we are through him and we truly become a new creation, we receive a new name. And in Revelations 3.12, it says that those who overcome will receive a new name. And that's what all of this is about, is being an overcomer. It is all about overcoming through him. Um, we are called daughter. It, this is our identity in our father. You are his child. Um, 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. Um, we are called righteous. This is our position with our father. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we, could, we would become the righteousness of God. And we are called light. This is our purpose. And everything that we do, we are to be a light. Everything that we do. Um, a light in the darkness. Ephesians 5.8 says, At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. And that's what we, have, we are called to in everything. Um, the list could go on and on. The Bible tells us and there's so many things that God, you know, he renames us. But on this lady's encounter, I want to, this is where I'm going to read you guys a little bit of her story. He, um, the disciples, after she was, after she received Christ, she was baptized. And so after she was baptized, the disciples renamed her and they named her Potini, which is the light or the enlightened one. And her story is absolutely amazing. So I'm going to read that to you real quick. i Ugh, I'll, be, I'll have you out of here before too long. Um, so this is a, a off of, I looked at several different sites. This one here is off of a orth, Orthodox Christian something site, but there was a lot of it. Most of it's written in the Catholic stuff. So that's where, just in case you guys were wondering where I got my source. Um, so it says, St. Fotini lived in the first century Palestine. Palestine. She was the Samaritan woman who Christ had visited the well asking for water. Um, it was she who accepted the living water offered her by Christ himself after repenting from her many sins. That's what they say. Um, she went and told the townspeople that um, she had met the, met the Christ. For this, she is sometimes recognized as the first to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Um, she converted her five sisters. First place she did was went to her home, worked on her family. Her five sisters were converted and her two sons. They all became tireless evangelists for Christ. The apostles of Christ baptized her and gave her the name Potini, which means the enlightened one. She is remembered by the church as the holy martyr and equal to the apostles. After St. Peter and Paul were martyred, St. Potini and her family left their homeland of Sychar in Samaria and traveled to Carthage to proclaim the gospel of the Christ there. During the reign of Emperor Nero in the uh, first century, excessive cruelty was displayed among, um, against the Christians. Um, she lived in Carthage with her young son, um, I, Joseph, I think. Um, her eldest son, Victor, fought bravely in the Roman army against the barbarians and was appointed military commander in the city of uh, Asia Minor. Uh, later, Nero called him to Italy to arrest and punish the Christians. Sebastian, an officer in Italy, said to Victor, Victor's her son, I know that you and your, mo you, your mother and your brother are followers of Christ, as a friend, I advise you to submit to the will of the emperor. If you, inform on, um, if you inform on any Christians, you will receive their wealth. I will. I shall write to your mother and brother, asking them not to preach Christ in public. Let them practice their faith in secret. Victor replied, I want to be a preacher of Christianity, just like my mother and my brother. Sebastian said, oh, Victor, we all, we all know what woes, what woes await you, your mother and your brother. Then Sebastian suddenly felt a sharp pain in his eye. He was dumbfounded, and his face was somber. For three days, Sebastian laid there blind without uttering a word. On the fourth day, he declared, The God of the Christians is the only true God. St. Victor, asked asked Victor asked why Sebastian had suddenly changed his mind, and Sebastian replied, Because Christ is calling me too. Soon he was baptized and immediately regained his sight, and uh, Sebastian's servants after witnessing the miracle, were also baptized. So reports of this reach Nero. Nero goes on, I'm not going to sit here and read it word for word, but Nero goes on to um, bring St. Potini and all of the people following her um, to him. He was going, you know, pretty much to 
to chastise him, get rid of, to take care of him. And um, of course, she wouldn't change her mind. So he took all of the men that were following her and he had them all blinded. He took the women and he set them um, in like queen's chairs in front of a table of gold and jewels. And when he did, he called his daughter in and he said, now I want you to pretty much tease them with this. You know, I'm pretty, this will transform any girl pretty much. You know, just they can have whatever they want off that table if they will quit preaching this, about this Jesus. And so um, whenever his daughter came in to talk to him, well, she ends up getting saved. And so then he was really, really angry. So St. Potini, she ended up going through tons and tons of torture. She um, refused, absolutely refused to quit preaching about this Jesus. I mean, she had an encounter at the well with him. This woman was passionate about what she was doing. And so, you know, he ended up having everybody else crucified um, because no matter what kind of punishment he tried, it wouldn't work. He tried, you know, having their hands beat. They couldn't feel the pain. He tried having them, uh, ugh, I'm not going to tell you everything, it's really gross, but he did a lot of things, and, and it did not kill these people. And so he finally ended up um, having some tied to trees and, and then some crucified. And then Potini, um, he tried putting her... Uh, down like a well and have her starve to death and it didn't work so he pulled her back out and then he had her skinned put back down in the well left her there for a week brought her back out she was actually upset the story says that she was actually upset because she wanted to be a martyr she wanted to die for Jesus but she no matter what they did she couldn't die but she was you know finally she they put her back in prison kept her there but the time that she was in that prison she transformed the prison into a church and one night she was praying, and she told God, she said, I'm tired, you know, pretty much I'm done, and he took her. And so, you know, he had a purpose for her. That is the reason he had to stop in Samaria. He had an entire, you know, just a nation that had to be rocked, you know, for him. So once God has get, gotten a hold of us, and he's brought that restoration and that transformation, the, next, the last thing is that he will send us. And that is something that we have to just get used to. Um, he's going to send us. The current series that Pastor's been teaching on is uncomfortable. Um, being sent is uncomfortable. I'm almost positive that Potini running back to that town, telling people who have looked down on her her whole life, was uncomfortable. But her passion overran that. Amen? I'm sure that her going and being skinned alive and then thrown into a well, and, you know, that, that was uncomfortable. But she still transformed a prison into a church after that. I mean, there is the passion that is there. Our passion should completely overrun our uncomfort. And I don't know why my mouth's so dry. So anyways, so following Christ is not always going to be comfortable because he did not call us to a life of casual comfort. He called us to a life of passion. He called us to a life of discomfort. I know that's scary, but it is. You know, uh, I've, heard, I've even heard pastors say, you know, when we have teach somebody about salvation, you know, we're always excited and stuff like that, but you should almost have a class, a 101 salvation class before, saying, okay, now, <laughs> just be prepared. Because the enemy, you are a threat to the enemy when you're saved. And so once that happens, you know, he's going to try. And that's why we have to be set. We have to be established through our God in order to overcome what, the lies and the things that he has to throw at us. So, um. One of the things, you know, that we need to remember is that, you know, we pray this all the time. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means our mandate is to bring heaven to earth. We are, you know, to portray Jesus Christ on this earth. And are we doing it right now? Not like we should. Are we as passionate as this woman here? No, not really. I think if someone threatened to skin me, I might run the other way. But, you know, <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was praying after I read her story, and, you know, and I was, I was just telling God, I was like, God, I want to be a leader of passion for you. I want to be that person. Do not send me somewhere where they're going to skin me. Don't send me somewhere where <laughs> they're going to try to break my fingers. But, you know, I want to be that. I, that's, the, that's the example that I want to set, you know, with everybody, everywhere I go. I mean, and it's not just passion, you know, for preaching to somebody, but passion to love somebody, even in the midst of their worst, passion to just, to just be there. That is what we, as the women of God, as children of God, as daughters, that's who we are. That is how we're supposed to walk on a daily basis. Um, so we have got to get rid of these chains that are binding us. Amen? Amen. All right. So um, uh, 
One of the things that I put in here, Isaiah 6, 8, it says, you know, here I am, Lord, send me. Um, that is my prayer constantly. You know, whatever you have of me, I'll do it. Um, and that is something that he wants from each one of us as his daughters. He just wants us to be willing vessels for him. Um, and so, Lena, will you guys come up and play a little bit? Please. <laughs> just like that. She's going to come up and play just a little bit for us. Um, and I don't care what you do. Just do whatever you want to do, okay? But, um, and then I forgot to do this beforehand, so I'm going to send you to the back to get some, some paper. Can you go grab me, like, some paper? We're going to tear it up. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I want to do tonight is I want um, to invite everybody. I know, for me personally, we all have lies that have been, you know, just embedded into us, even from childhood. Um, I remember as a child being told I was fat. Those lies, they plant in you, and you think about them the rest of your life. Um, there are, you know, times that, that um, well, I mean, just to be honest, my mom and dad, you know, divorced when I was a very young age, and I was always told that my dad, you know, he had his own life. Not necessarily he didn't want anything to do with me, but he had his own life, which he did remarry, and he had his own kids, but you begin to have those, those um, seeds of rejection that begin to come up. Um, and that rejection will make you crazy. I mean, it will make, that's where I think those looks, when people look at you and immediately you feel rejected, that's a, that's a spiritual thing. That is something that's in us that God does not want there. Um, you know, there's, there's just all kinds of things that, that we as, as women, you know, we are the worst with comparing ourselves with each other. I mean, I have a, a group of girls that I work out with every morning, and I have done this for I think 18 months, but still, when I go there, I'm still comparing myself to them. You know, I wished I could look like that one, or I wished I could look like that one. Like Shannon's arms, gosh. I'm like, oh, I want to look like that. You know, I mean, you just, you compare. You're constantly comparing. Um, and that can bring so much um, just heaviness into our lives. It's something that we do not need to be hanging on to. Um, so what I want to do tonight is I want to invite you guys. I've got our little vessels down here. So I want you guys to take, just take some time. She's just going to play through some music here. Um, and then, you know, we've got some paper up here. You can bring it up here. I don't know if we just grab a pen out of the back of the chair. We'll put it back in a minute. Um, but, you know, come up here and whatever lies you have allowed the enemy to place inside of you, whatever you have hung on to for so long that's kept you from being free and allowing that living water to just flow inside of you, come write them on these papers. We're going to put them in these vessels here tonight. Um, do not have to put your name on it at all. But one of the things that I'm wanting to do is, is our leadership team will take these lies and we will begin to just, just pray against them in your lives. Every single time we get together, we'll just pray against those in your lives. And, and just by, you know, as you have testimonies of overcoming that, I want to hear about it because I know it's going to happen. I know it will um, because that is, I mean, that is just, we have a God that does that. So if you guys want to come on up, we're going to fill them out. I'll be the first one to do it. And then you can stay up here and we're going to pray or you can go back to your seat. It doesn't matter, but I'll have my prayer team up here ready to just pray with you guys and, and then um, we'll be ready to go. Uh, for the night. So let's go ahead and do that.
guys. So if you guys have, um, if you guys want to have specific prayer, I mean, just for yourselves, like something that you just need to, to have prayer for tonight, these girls are up here to do that. Um, I'm going to pray over the lies of the enemy, and we're going to break some chains. And then feel free to come up here, and, and we'll, we'll stand up here, and we'll just, you know, if you guys just need personal prayer, we'll be here, okay? All right. Where's these lies at? They're all over the place, aren't they? Oh, gosh, that one's got nails in it. <laughs> Sorry. That's right. Nails went in my hand. <laughs> my first form of torture for being uncomfortable. <laughs> all right. I'm going to bring this vessel up here. All right, Father God, we just thank you, Father, so much um, just for revelation in you, Father God. Father, you know the lies that are in this jar. Father God, you know um, the lies that have been spoken to your daughters here tonight, Father God. And we just say right now, Father, we just break these lies right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, you said um, that as your daughters, Father God, that we would be made whole and we would be um, just made one with you, Father. And I just declare that right now, Father God. Father, we just command every lie of the enemy and every single life here to be silenced right now from this day forward, Father. As we um, go throughout our days, Father God, that, that you will begin to to just give us that hunger and that thirst and that that desire, Father God, for you that um, to get into your word and to know you, Father. And, and in that, we have that knowledge to, to fight and to battle these lies, Father. Um, that it is through your knowledge that we, through knowledge of you, that we will be set free. We will be set free in you, Father God. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor, Father God. I thank you, Father, that, um, that uh, you have begun to to renovate our lives, Father God. You've begun to go in and, you've, and, and to rebuild, Father God, to restructure, Father, our, our thought process, Father God, um, our heart stances, Father, um, just everything that is in us, God. You, have, you are going in and you are completely renovating it, God, completely transforming it, Father. I thank you, God, for meeting us here tonight. Father, meeting us at this, at this well, Father God, that, of, of passion, Father, and transformation, God. We give these lies, we give them, we put them into your hands, Father, for you to just to just demolish in our lives, God. We give you all the glory, we give you all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want you guys to stand up for just a minute. Can you win a chain breaker? Can you do chain breaker? Oh, we're going to go out singing some Chain Breaker. Sorry, it's like a last minute thing. I just feel like we need to again. Um, there you go. Do you need Amy? Amster? I just feel like we need to sing it again. We need to go out declaring um, broken chains tonight. Amen. And don't be uncomfortable coming up here to worship if you want to. You guys are walking in freedom from this day forward. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice from the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain. Search for the light of day in the dead of night. We've 
found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run into things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. victory. Can we do that? All right. Father God, I thank you um, for just making this such an amazing night. I thank you for all that we have received, Father God, and I thank you that chains are broken. In Jesus' name, I just ask that you watch over every single person as they go home tonight, and we plead the blood of Jesus Christ over them and their families, Father, as they travel. Bring us all back here safely Sunday, um, and just let us be a light, a passionate light for you everywhere that we go. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, at the count of three, I want you to shout freedom, okay? One, two, three, freedom! All right, amen.